Today we're beginning week two in our series, The Generosity Revolution. Last week, we talked about the reality that all of us are found in Christ when we find ourselves grateful for the generosity of God, that we have been forgiven so much that now with changed hearts, we can live a different and new kind of generous life. Today, I want to focus a little bit more specifically um, about the generosity revolution and what happens when following Jesus Christ and your personal faith in him starts an avalanche of change in your life and how that impacts your finances and your own relationship to money and to giving. Isaiah 32, 8 says that generous people plan to do what is generous and they stand firm in their generosity. And what this verse talks about is um, certainly a, a life that is changed, uh, but it's also about an intentionality. And I want to come back at the end of the message and talk to you about some ways to be intentional uh, in your discipleship in this, this area. In Luke 19.10, the kind of core verse for 2021 for us, as we get back to the basics in this COVID season, and as I do every week, I want to remind you, we will get through this season. Um, God will see us to the other side. He's faithful. But as we go back to what is essential, core, the, the North Star, the guiding light of, of our faith, it is this in Luke 19, 10. For the Son of Man came to seek and to save the lost. That's why God came in Christ. That's why the church is here on earth. And believe it or not, that's why you're living before you're going to heaven. To seek and save the lost. The lost, that was me. It was all of us until the generosity of God gripped our hearts and, and we began following Jesus Christ through life-changing faith. And a reminder, if our faith isn't such that it changes our life, then it really can't be faith. And many of us have sort of devolved and, and settled in kind of an entropy way to this uh, state where we're, we're knowers, but we're not necessarily believers. And there's a passivity in our uh, Christianity instead of an act activity in, in actively following Jesus, hard on the heels of love every single day. Follow me, Jesus said in Matthew 4, 19. It's such a wonderful dynamic invitation to, uh, to a whole new kind of life. It's the decision to follow God in love that changes everything. It changes the course of my thinking, of uh, my doing, my loving, my hating, my speech. Following Jesus changes everything about me. Um, and instead of following myself and my fears and my traumas, uh, my insecurities and the anxieties of other people in this broken world, I now have a new light to follow through, through life in the world. And, and it's a heart-changing journey. And it, it really changes my relationship to everything. Certainly my relationship to God becomes one of freedom and joy. My relationship to myself becomes one of, of grace and self-acceptance. And my relationship with, with other people becomes one of, of just endless generosity and, and my relationship with money changes as well. It's not my source of security anymore. The question all of us people who've transitioned from lost to found need to ask ourselves is this. Through all the changes of life, through all the hard, and the COVIDs, the, the losses, the, the aches and pains, is this, does God keep his promises? And that's the question that, that just should guide and inspire our, our lives. The truth is, life-changing relationships, um, you know, with, with, with the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit change all other relationships underneath him, including our relationship with money. And so here's the deal. Jesus wasn't afraid to talk about money, and neither are we. Jesus wasn't embarrassed, and I'm not either. And as your shepherd, you're responsible to go to your scripture. Um, you are free to buy a copy of this thing. It's called the Bible, the bestseller, and to read it every day for yourself and to decide what you believe about this, this call and invitation of Jesus Christ. Today, I want to share with you in this generosity revolution 
uh, a new portrait and a new way of thinking about your relationship with money. And the truth is, big picture, 50,000 feet is that, that people who trust Jesus, they become ever more generous. I mean, it's not just a, you know, a first step on the stair and then you, 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 you land there. It is, now I'm following Jesus, my heart has changed, I was lost and now I'm found. I followed myself, now I'm following Christ. Um, before I had my own broken spirit to, to lead me through life, now I have the Holy Spirit of God Almighty indwelling me. And now he's my inspiration for my living. So I, I don't just take one step and stop. I begin a, a journey up a, a stair step that, that ends in the very presence of God in eternity. In Matthew 6, 19 through 24, Jesus just, you know, he just did as he always does. He spoke so, so amazingly clearly. And yet even in the clarity, there is infinite depth and paradox and and sort of this, this um, you know, you know, this ever uh, rippling pond effect of, of fullness and meaning in what he says. So, so Jesus said something here that that no preacher could ever top. And so I'm just going to read it for you, kind of as the message today, and ask that you would listen carefully with fresh ears to what Jesus said, and and ask yourself what did he mean, and and what does what he said mean to me? In Matthew chapter six verses 19 through 24, and in context, this is, this is in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount at the beginning point of Jesus' ministry. And there was something marvelous and attractive about Jesus. Uh, he was different than all of the other religious leaders. He taught as one having authority. He taught as one having authenticity. He taught as one having compassion and empathy. And he lived a generosity in who he touched, not just the important people, but everybody. And so he goes up on a mountainside, he sits down, and the crowds gather around him, and Jesus begins to teach them. And in Matthew 6, 19 through 24, he just said something life-changing and profound in terms of our relationship with money. And he said this, Do not store up for yourselves treasures on earth, where moths and vermin destroy, and where thieves break in and steal. In the Greek, it's a kind of a funny, um, you know, reading of this store up for yourselves treasures because it, it kind of uh, could be translated like this. Don't treasure up treasure for yourselves. Um, so, you know, treasure is in there twice in these, these, these two phrases. And, and so I want you to think about what you treasure and what is treasure to you. The word offers the world offers one set of treasures to seek, um, and you know what they are. Um, you know what you are tempted to work for in this world. What uh, what you are tempted, even as you think about what is best in the world, and and you think, well, I should treasure that. And then, of course, there is also the gravity of the, the the lightlessness, the darkness in us, the brokenness in us that that is also drawn towards what is dark and broken in the world. And so we treasure the wrong things as well. But the world offers a set of treasures to seek and, and the kingdom of God offers another set of treasures. And, and what we're talking about is a lifelong set of, of um, processes and, and a journey. Do not be storing up for yourselves. So this isn't a one-time thing. It's a way of living thing. It's a uh, it's, it's a what am I after thing. It's a what, what am I considering, you know, a success to be. It is how do I answer my insecurity. And, and it's, it's a very deep thing Jesus is talking about here. And when he says where, where rust, rust and moth or where vermin destroy, thieves break in, what Jesus is talking about is that everything in this world is fundamentally insecure. It's broken. And if I can make up a word, um, everything that we would seek to keep as treasure in this world is unkeepable. Now, if some investment guru could tell you that, hey, everything that you've invested, they look at your portfolio, your 401k, and they say, look, everything you've invested in, um, in two weeks time is going to be absolutely worthless. So 
here's how you should change your investments. Now you'd have a real decision to make at that point of whether you trusted what they said about the worthlessness of your investing and the worthwhileness of their advice. But then what if you didn't listen and two weeks later, the stocks that you had invested in just completely tanked and you have echoing in your words this, this word of warning? That's kind of where Jesus is and, and what he's saying to each one of us. And so um, Jesus said in, in Luke chapter 9, 24 and 25, he said, you know, regarding this fundamental unkeepableness of, of our treasure on earth, he said, if you try to hang on to your life in this world, you're going to lose it. But if you give up your life for me, you'll save it. And in the verse 25, he said, and what benefit will it give you if you gain the whole world but lose your own soul? And, and, and that really is like a picture of, of a man growing through all of his short days on earth to gather a bunch of stuff. And then, and then he is dead and and it is all dead to him. There's kind of a pointlessness to that journey. But Jesus says in, in Matthew 6, um, verse 20, store up for yourselves treasures in heaven. In this ongoing journey you have through life, make it a different kind of journey. Um, make it a, a, a kingdom seeking journey in my footsteps to where you're becoming ever more generous in me. So be storing up for yourselves treasures in heaven where moth and vermin do not destroy, where thieves um, do not break in and steal. So instead of investing our lives in getting all that we can't keep, we are called to invest our lives in, in giving all we can here to keep it forever. So we can't keep it here but we can give it away here and keep it forever. So it's a deep paradox and, and a real limitation to, to decide whether we believe it or not. This is a security trade. Without Jesus, we build our lives in the world trying to overcome the scarcity of the world, and it's a failing mission. Because whatever we gather for ourselves, no matter how hard we try um, in this broken world, what we, what we gather is going to be rusty or stolen. It's going gonna, it's gonna to slip through our fingers. But whatever, whatever we invest for eternity in our giving, it, it becomes something that, that is an investment that, that is kept forever and grows forever and is secure forever. Nothing in this world can, can rattle or take what God has kept for us. With Jesus, we build our lives trusting the unfailing generosity of God forever. And I want to remind you that trust is an active thing. It requires energy, intentionality. It requires choices. It requires movement. It requires action. You know, you can be a knower and be as lost as a goose. But a found person isn't merely a knower. There is knowing involved, but knowing is an invitation to believing. And believing is an invitation to acting. And acting is always an invitation to to generosity that reveals Jesus and something otherworldly in our living. Not the values of the world, but the kingdom that has come. And in just a few moments in this passage, you know, Jesus is going to move towards sort of the culmination after he tells us, do not worry about anything on earth, for your heavenly Father knows and provides. And then he says this in Matthew 6, 33, but you, you're different, you're whole life course has been altered. You seek first the kingdom of, of God and his righteousness, his rightness, and everything else will be taken care of. All this other stuff, all this, this stuff that you think you need in the world, I got it. I got it covered. <laughs> It'll be given to you. So with Jesus, we build our lives trusting actively in the unfailing generosity of God forever. And really, this is the ultimate illustration of delayed gratification, right? Um, what, we, what we give away, we keep. What we, uh, what we seek for in the moment, we lose forever. Now, this is the question we have to, to ask ourselves. Do we believe in this generosity of God that, that 
that the reality of heaven uh, has overshadowed the realities of earth, that the promises of God are stronger than, than the pain and trauma of life in this world, that the reality of what God said is bigger than emotionally what I feel and what I see and what I understand in my own thinking and even what other people say. So here are some of the promises of God that, that we who are found are found in. Ephesians 3, 20 and 21 says, Now to him who is able to do immeasurably more than all we ask or imagine, according to his power that is at work within us and in the church, to him be glory throughout all uh, of generations forever and ever. So you and I have big dreams of, of what the meaning of our life should be and, and, and what success looks like. And God says, no, you're not going to find that in the world. But in me, you have limitless ability to ask for my generosity and, and you will find me limitless. In 2 Corinthians 9, 8, the scripture says, and God is able to make all grace abound to you. This is from his generosity. The generosity of his love flows infinite grace. And God is able. His abilities are sure. You can trust him. Do you? Do I? But you, we can. And God is able to make all grace abound to you. So that in all things, at all times, having everything you need, you can abound in every good work. In other words, in everything worth doing in life, in everything that will make life an ultimate success and, 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 and full of joy and, and the freedom of God, there is an endless generosity available in a world of, of endless scarcity. Philippians 4.19 is just one of the clearest and plainest and, you know, uh, it's just there, you know, for everyone to believe and and I, I really, I, you know, I, I get really tired sometimes of, of, of some of us Jesus followers who, who want to feign ignorance, um, you know, about certain things and, and pretend that there's two classes of Christians, like, you know, there's preachers and people who, who know stuff, and then there's me who don't know stuff. Well, first of all, A, don't be happy in your ignorance. Pick up your Bible and read. You've got a, a, an intelligent brain and an inspiring God, and he will speak to you every single day to teach you everything you need to know and prepare you for eternity. And, 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 and B, you know, the, the plain truth of Scripture is so plain that a child can understand it. And, and so here it is in a way that is unmistakable in terms of our life in generosity in the midst of a world in scarcity. Philippians 4.19 says, And my God will meet all your needs according to the riches of his glory in Christ Jesus. Bam. Drop the mic, walk away, live your life a new way. Either it's true or it's not Either it is a poetic exaggeration of, of religious irrelevance, or this is a verse that you can simply rest your life in joyfully, freely. Jesus goes on to say, the eye is the lamp of the body. If your eyes are healthy, your whole body will be full of light. For years, I did not quite understand what Jesus was talking about. And, I, and I'm not claiming to have the fullness of, of the revelation here because, again, all scripture is meaningful, meaning as you pour it out, you'll never empty it out. So what is Jesus talking about? Well, I believe he's saying that the eye is a representation of desire. You know, those who struggle with pornography or struggle with, um, you know, uh, always window shopping or you're looking at food or, you know, even things on TV. Why are we looking? We're looking because there's desire behind the look. And so... I look at what I want. So it's a metaphor for desire. So if your desire is healthy, your whole body will be full of light because you're going to be pursuing in the right direction the right desires that are going to bring the right realities into your life. Um, but if your eyes are unhealthy, if your desires are unhealthy, if you want the wrong things, trust the wrong things, depend on the wrong things, build your life on the wrong things, then the scripture says your whole body will be full of darkness. If then the light within you is darkness, how great is that darkness? If we want the world, then we're going to live selfishly from the scarcity in the darkness of our own broken thoughts. And we're always going to be fighting off 
uh, the inevitable rust. I mean, have you ever like bought a new car and, and tried to keep it without dents and scratches? Have you ever like bought a new car and, and, uh, and, and imagined it being shiny 10 years from now or 15 years from now as it was the day it rolled off the, um, you know, the, the showroom floor? It ain't going to happen. You just leave it out in the sun and, <laughs> and, and the world begins and, and the degradation begins and the falling apart begins. That's the way it is in the world. So if we want the world and if we live selfishly from the scarcity and the darkness of our own thoughts, then we're going to experience uh, the losses of the world. But if we want the Lord, then we're going to live faithfully from generosity in the light of God's promises. And then the result is going to be an overflowing generosity that reveals not our greatness, but the glory of Christ and the, the hope of God in a hopeless world. And then Jesus went on to just, as he always does with all of his messages, just to, just to, to lay it out there in such a plain fork in the road kind of way. No one can serve two masters. Either you will hate the one and love the other, or you'll be devoted to one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Just let that sink in. What is my life going to be about? Where is my security going to be found? How do I think I will find happiness? Is it in the world and, and having enough of it in money? Or is it in Christ and having all the fullness of the kingdom of God given to me and all of the future of eternity in heaven opened up to me? Money matters. And your relationship to money reveals your relationship to God. And your relationship to God changes your relationship to, to everything else in the world. And instead of keeping our money selfishly for a short time, we as followers of Jesus are called to give it away generously for the, for the sake of all of eternity. And you want to know something? What Jesus is saying here? Money is, is really like one of these. It, it's really like a, a pulse oximeter. Um, and, and it really tells me kind of what's going on inside. How, how much the, the oxygen of, of faith in Christ is, is enriching and giving life to every cell in my body. How fast is my heart beating for God? And, 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 and how slow is it, is it, you know, beating for the world? I mean, it, it really is a revelation of where I stand. So honestly, this isn't about buying God or buying off God. That's, that's foolish, sinful, hellish talk and ideas. It's about honesty and revelation and transparency. And if you want to look at, at how you love God, look at how you love money. Look at how you spend money. What are your priorities? Um, what, where are your securities? Where are your disciplines? Where, where's the, the planning in your life? Where's the intentionality? Because generous people are intentional about, about their living and, and their giving. I just want to kind of close with this, guys. Until we've given all, we can all give more. Um, that's just the truth. God in Christ gave all that there was. There was nothing more to give. And, and so, so that is true for him, but for the rest of us, until we've given all, we can all give more. And, and the disciples' journey is, is this journey, that we are on a journey of ever-increasing faith, ever-increasing more in every category of our life of trusting, of serving, of believing, of sharing Jesus, of leading other lost people to faith in Christ. There is no end to any of these because, because it's limitless, because God's boundless, because, because there's no ceiling to growth. Ephesians 4, 11 through 13 kind of concludes with, in terms of our, our, our gifting, our job is, you know, is as pastors and teachers, whatever, is to equip you for the work God's called you to do. And then the scripture says, until we all reach maturity, attaining the whole measure of the fullness of, of God. Oh my gosh. God actually expects you to be filled with all of him. Until we've given all, we can all give more because we can never outgive God. God didn't just talk the talk. He walked the walk in Christ. And, and, and it's not about the dollar amount of how much each of us gives. It's about how much we have left after we give. And if our, 
giving doesn't require growing faith, then it isn't giving. And, and if our giving has been faithless for a season and stagnant, then, then it's not faith either, and it, it needs to be activated and restarted. One day, Jesus was with the disciples. This isn't a, a parable. It is a, uh, an observation that Jesus made. There they are in the temple, and the temple was kind of the center of, of, um, of Hebrew faith in the first century. Um, it, was, it was the place where, where people would, would go to pray, obviously, and, and, and worship, and they also went there to give because giving intentionally has always been a part of, of, of loving God, trusting God. And the scripture says in Luke chapter uh, 21, verses one through four, um, as Jesus looked up, he saw the rich putting their gifts into the temple treasury. And he also saw a poor widow with two very small copper coins. And she put those in and, and Jesus said, truly I tell you, this poor widow has put in more than all the others. All these other people gave out of their wealth out of their abundance. In other words, they were giving what didn't cost them at all, what didn't require them to trust the Heavenly Father. But she, out of her pot poverty, put in all she had to live on. It's kind of ironic. Jesus didn't go over and stop her. Jesus didn't even go over and give anything to her because he knew that God had already given her all that she needed and that his Heavenly Father would provide for her. He was delighted in the, the reality that she had given all at great faith at high cost. The paradox of God's provision is everywhere through scripture. When we keep for ourselves, we lose it. I learned this uh, you know, in, in high school. Um, I was trying to save for college and, and buy a car and, and I'm, I'm working full time uh, in a church as a minister of maintenance, a janitor. Um, so I'm going to school and working eight hours after school every day. And I'm making about $8,500 a, a year. I thought I was just rolling in it. And, uh, and I wasn't tithing. I, I wouldn't, I wouldn't give because I thought I'm just a student. I'm just, I'm trying to save for school. I got college to pay for. God, you told me to go to college. Surely you want me to pay for that. And, and I began to hear scripture and I began to listen to my pastor and I really began to be convicted and I rebelled. I just simply said, no, I, it doesn't make sense to me. I'm not going to do it. And the crazy thing was is, is that I kept the 100% for myself, according to my thinking and my fears and my values and my vision of what's good. It slipped through my fingers like sand. When in my rebelliousness, I finally gave in and began to, to give God a beginning 10%, I was just astonished that the 90% went farther than the 100% ever did. And this is the truth of Proverbs 11, 24, and 25. One person gives freely, yet gains even more. Another withholds unduly and comes to poverty. A generous person will prosper. Whoever refreshes others or blesses others will be blessed. Today, here's what I want you to do. Bring your relationship with money into the heart of your relationship with Jesus. Don't leave them separate. Don't imagine that, uh, that, that when your heart is baptized into faith in Christ uh, and you were buried into baptism, that there was a part of you that, that wasn't covered in that. You know, no, 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 no. Your, your wallet and your credit card went in with you and, and um, the, the, the love of Jesus changes everything. A couple of things that can't be argued, because here we get into a place where some people say, well, the tithe is, is Old Testament, it's not biblical. Here's a couple of things that can't be argued. And if you want to argue them, argue with scripture, not with me. Um, first of all, is that in the Old Testament, people who trusted God gave 10% of everything they had and then gave offerings on top of that. And this is, this is the truth revealed all through the scriptures from Deuteronomy through, through Malachi. Uh, bring the whole tithe, Malachi 3, 10 says, into the storehouse that there might be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord God Almighty, and see if I will not open, uh, throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will be not enough room to store it. As many people have commented, this is the only place in scripture where God really says, test me. And, um, and so in the Old Testament, people who trusted God did this. You can't argue that. You can't, okay? Now, second thing you can't argue. Some of us will. Um, in the New Testament, people who trusted God, they gave everything. In Acts chapter 4, uh, the scripture tells us this in verse 32. All the believers were one in heart and mind. 
No one claimed that any of their possessions was their own. They shared everything they had. So until we've given all, we can all give more. Until we're here, we're not here. With great power, the apostles continued to testify to the resurrection of the Lord Jesus Christ and God's grace, the scripture says, was on them all. If I can turn the page. Uh, was, his grace was powerfully at work in them so that there was no needy persons among them. And from time to time, those who owned land or houses sold them and brought the money and laid it at the apostles' feet and it was distributed to everyone who had need. In the New Testament, People who trusted God gave everything they had without limits. That's just the reality. And so if I'm going to trust God, um, then, then I am called to do so in, in a way that matches what is going on in the Old Testament and in the New Testament in some form or fashion. So here's the challenge for you. Grow in your giving. There, there are five categories of generosity in the journey of a disciple. This is a, a document that, that you can download um, at sevenrun.com uh, uh, you know, forward slash give. Um, it's also one we're going to be sending out to you. Uh, in fact, you may have received it this morning. I want you to read it. It's challenging. It challenged me. And the simple reality is that, that there are five categories of of, of, of you know, of this journey, the beginning giver. Uh, and, and, and here I would say in terms of, of your growth, if, if you're giving nothing, start giving something sometime. Okay, so there you go. Just begin to give something sometime. The second category is of a consistent giver. Once you start giving something sometime, start giving something regularly and, and just make it a, a part of your practice that, hey, I'm going to consistently give to God. Then there's the intentional giver. Uh, start moving towards the tithe. You know, the, the reality is if you're giving 2% regularly, trust God for three. And, and I'm just going to tell you, I, I think all heaven will applaud, and I certainly will, you know, just for your faith and, and, and journey. If you're at 6% of, of your income, uh, step up and grow in your journey to, to give 8%. Think about your spending in terms of your giving. There's the sacrificial giver. Begin giving in a way that changes you and puts you in a place of only God dependence. I, I want to be very clear with you guys. All of this goes against my old nature. The lost me hates this and, and, and opposes the found me. And, and the times in my life to where, to where we have been challenged to give in, in kind of, uh, of ways that, that are only God dependent. And, and it's like, there's no way we can do this. And then we, we do it and God does it. It's like, oh, no, we couldn't, but God did. And that's what sacrificial giving is about. And then there's the legacy giver. Move towards giving in the full light of eternity. Ask What's the maximum impact I can possibly make in the financial giving of my life, regardless of my income? Remember the widow's mites. You see, we're, until we're, we've given all, we can all give more. And, and, and the reason that's true is because we cannot outgive God. We never will run into the limits of, of God where he says enough. It's just impossible. Now, here's the truth of my own journey, and I know it's the truth of many of your journeys as well. We often ask, can I afford to give? But the real question behind the question is, can God be trusted? And that is the biggest question of any of our lives. Today, I want to challenge you with all of my heart to let the journey, uh, the generosity revolution begin in your life. And to let the journey of trust grow in you because people who trust Jesus are on a lifelong path to become ever more generous. It never stops. And it's all encompassing in every arena of our life, our speech, our time, um, you know, our kindness and, and our money. And if you wonder if you can afford to give, I guess in one sense, the answer is, no, you can't, but God. 
And is the framework of your life going to be centered on you and your abilities or God and his? And I just want to tell you, as I continue to, to, to give more and to try to grow in my own generosity, no, not try, do, God can be trusted. Will you trust him? Today, if you are born into this world, but you have never been reborn into Christ, it's not just religious language. If you have grown up overwhelmed by the world and trusting yourself, and you've never consciously committed your life to believing in and giving your life to follow Jesus Christ, you can do that with a, a simple request. Jesus, save me. And if you're here as a believer and you're plateaued and stagnant, it's time to get growing, trusting God and to let the generosity revolution begin.